On today's episode, I had a lot of fun chatting with Felipe Mejia, where we talked about how he was gifted a mobile home for his high school graduation, and he turned that into millions of dollars. We go over what it's like trying to balance your family with multiple businesses. He has multiple businesses just like I do, and just kind of the struggles that go along with that, while also trying to scale those businesses. We also go over how he's helping a ton of people get out of the rat race and achieve financial independence. So we had a great talk. Make sure you stay to the end. Now, let's jump into it. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? My company, Future Flipper, can help. We've taught hundreds of people all over the country how to flip, wholesale, and buy rental properties. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. Whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your company, Future Flipper can help. We have courses, coaching, and events for all levels of investors. So if you want to take the next step, go to futureflipper.com and book a free consultation to see how we can best help you. Once again, that's futureflipper.com. If you've ever wanted to invest with me on my real estate deals, it's now possible. At Pineda Capital, we're purchasing value-add real estate all across the country. This includes multifamily, commercial, and land development. The best part is with my network, social media presence, and marketing strategies, we're able to get the very best deals that others don't have access to. You can join in with me on those deals if you're an accredited investor. If you wanna learn more, head over to PinedaCapital.com to see our current opportunities. Once again, that's PinedaCapital.com. Welcome to the Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. Now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I've got Felipe Mejia. Did I say that right? <laughs> you said it right. All right, good. He was telling me everyone calls him Mejia. Yeah, they you do. You know, up. back in Nashville where he's from. You know, there's not too many Latinos out there. No, there's not. No, absolutely not. So Felipe is an interesting guy. I got to start off with the story of how we connected. Um, You know, a lot of people hit me up on Instagram and and different things. And let me tell you guys, this dude was relentless. (laughs) Like literally DM me every day to like, I don't even know. How How did you even... Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't like it, it wasn't like hey Ryan talk to me hey Ryan talk to me it was like show love I was like showing love on your post yeah or I would tag or I would retag something you posted and then I would slide in your DM and be like yo that was a cool post and then you would just heart it for a while I'm sure it was some of your people but eventually <laughs> <laughs> eventually you did reach back out and after something you would say like thank you or something yeah, yeah. so it started kind of growing from there mm-hmm. then I would try to add value wherever I can. Uh, for example, I think you put out some YouTube videos and I did some like, oh, this is what I think of Ryan's video. Yeah. yeah. So forth. So it kind of got your attention. Yeah. Uh, I'm good at communication and I'm good with like people skills and kind of putting smart people in the right room. So with that, I also kind of know how to start relationships with people. Yeah, for sure. Without so, bugging, right? Without like, hey. Well, you know, it, there's a fine line between very bugging fine. and following up <laughs> aggressively. So we all know this with sellers and, you know, being in sales, but uh Yeah, you know, you kept, uh, you know, following up and, and, you know, hitting me up and everything. And then eventually um, you're like, hey, dude, can you please speak to our community, Rat Race to FI? And uh, I'm like, okay, like what's going on with it? And you're like, okay, it's these times, blah, blah, blah. You know, we we got a lot of new people trying to become financially independent. Mm -hmm. I go, that's great. I love that stuff. And you're like, well, you know, we do our thing at night. And I'm like, I don't do nights. Like I just you know, I don't do my zooms at night. It is what it is. And then, um, you kind of left me no choice. Cause you're like, well, we're going to do one exception, you know, during the daytime for you, but yeah. you, you got to do it. And I was like, all right, you know, I'll hop on with the group. And a lot of them were already people who followed me and mm-hmm. seen my videos. So it, it was cool chatting with them, man. Yeah. We really appreciated that. Um, mm-hmm. I do remember that. I think that's been the only time in a, in a year and a half from rat race that we've like moved it. So it's usually yeah. Mondays and Wednesdays at 8 PM central. Yeah. Uh, selfish plug. Yeah. And uh, you were like, no, I'm in the middle of doing a video. So it was it was during your lunchtime when you were doing one of your couch flipping videos. Uh-huh. I think you even were in the storage unit, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when you when you spoke to a rat race and it was dope. Everyone, a lot of our rat race members follow you. Um, and we talked about this on the golf course, actually, how who your avatar is, surprisingly. So uh, a lot of our members are like, man, please, Ryan, Pine-. out of everyone, like <laughs> Ryan was the person they wanted to get on. That's awesome, man. Oh, I love that. Um, and one thing you were telling me about your community is a lot of them are Latino and minorities and everything. And 
you know, we were talking about this. We, we went golfing yesterday mm-hmm. and, you know, you were like, yeah, you know, we're this is mainly our founders. We're all Latino. We're really trying to uplift the community and other things. And I was like, take a guess at who you think my like people that follow me are because Facebook and YouTube and these things will tell you, you know, demographics. Right. Um, they used to tell you race, but I don't think um, they're allowed to do that anymore. They probably, they definitely still have the data. They right. just don't tell you. It's not PC. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but they for sure have the data. Um, but I asked you, I go, who do you think is like my top demographic? And what'd you say? Yeah. So my guess was like 25 to 40, maybe rich white males that wanted to invest, but didn't want to quit their jobs type of thing. I was like, that's gotta be who's like investing with him or following him or buying his stuff. Yeah. And we were wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I actually, um, I thought about this too. You know, anytime you guys are making content or, you know, you got a business or a product, you got to know who, you know, the person that is watching you or buying from you or whatever, like who they are, right? because you want to build content that caters to them. And I started thinking about it and I, I looked at like, okay, who's in my coaching programs? Who's like the customers in my business? Who's at my brokerage? And I mean, we just walked through the brokerage. We saw a lot of Latino people. We saw a lot of, um, you know, in your own community, which is a lot of Latinos, you're telling me they're they're fans and they watch my stuff. So it's like, what does that tell you right there? And I was surprised by that because, for one, I'm not Latino. I may look like it because, you know, I'm brown. But uh, And people do mistake me for being Latino a lot, especially when I was playing baseball. But um, in reality, I'm half white, half Filipino, and I just uh, kind of always perceive myself, I don't know, as being more white just because I grew up in America, you know, I'd never been to the Philippines. I, you know, grew up uh, more with the, my mom's side of the family, which is white. And uh, I don't know, that, that was like my own image of myself. Like I've never felt, I don't know, discriminated against or anything, Mm -hmm. but that's kind of not who I attract. Right. You know, I kind of attract a lot more minorities. And I guess too, as I dig, dig deep into it, I'm like, man, is it me or is it just kind of the industry, right? Like I'm reaching entrepreneurs and hustlers and I think you're going to get more minorities kind of in that niche than you would say tech. Right. So I think it's a, I think, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with, uh, with that part, just like minorities coming to this country and maybe not having the education or they weren't brought up in the culture here. So they don't know like high school leads to college leads to so forth and so on. And we can get into that. How like I graduated with my bachelor's in three years because I didn't know how to fill out the form. Um, (laughs) yeah, that's, that's a really funny story actually. But, uh, I also think that it has a lot to do with like what what I call like mirror imaging business. So like you're Brown, you look Latino, you're going to attract those people because that's where their eyes are going to go to. Right. 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 Like they see a white male and then they see you, let's say you guys are doing the same content, right? They're going to follow you over Graham Stephan. Because they're like, oh, I, I can, at least I can see myself as that person, even if it's just visually. Right. right. So I think that also has a lot to do with it. Right. No, hundred percent agree with you. So, um, it's just interesting as, as I grow and I look at kind of the people I attract and mm-hmm. I would say too, it, it's a, it's a very big mix. It's not just Latinos. Like sure. there's a lot of white people. We got black people. We got Asians. Like <laughs> Asians are probably actually the smallest, even though that's what <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. It, it just, it is what it is. Um, but I also, there's less Asians in this country than there are Latinos and right, white people. So sure. that's kind of is what it is. But, uh, yeah, man. So I, I was super hyped to talk about or talk to your community. Um, you guys are doing some really cool stuff, um, with all of them. And, uh, you know, I've gotten to know a little more about you. Like I said, we golfed yesterday, um, kind of for the first time hung out and, uh, got to hear a little bit of your story, but tell, tell everybody who's listening just a little bit about where you came from, who you are today. Yeah. uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I love, I love being able to tell my story. So I grew up in Nashville, uh, born and raised. Um, my parents got divorced when I was 11 going on 12. So that quickly, um, kind of like altered my life from one day to the next. It was kind of completely different. I always tell the story that like in our culture in the Latino community, not that it's right or wrong or anything, but like the male figure makes all the money. Mom kind of stays home, makes house or whatever. Uh, and when my parents got divorced, the money kind of went with my dad. 
So I always explain it like if you're ever swimming, like, and if you feel the water at your throat, you, you know you're not drowning. I don't want to ever say we were drowning, but we could definitely feel like the mortgage is coming up. There was always a little bit more month than, than money, you know? So what my mom did curiously was she like started renting out our basement at the house because that's all she got in the divorce was the house. Uh, so she started renting out the basement and it was like- She was house hacking. Yeah, she was house hacking before, and, you know, people made it cool and made yeah. it a book. So it was dope to see that. And that really, and then I explained like that really helped the waters kind of go more down to my stomach. So we had a, we had the bill, the biggest bill covered was their mortgage. So that kind of like put that spark of real estate in my mind, what it could do. But at first it was just like, I just want to get my bills paid with, with real estate. And then I saw the potential of, wait, I could do this over and over and over again. Um, so that's kind of where like real estate was planted. Um, then from there, man, just graduated high school. Well, that's a funny story. I got kicked out of high school uh, at 10th grade. What'd you do? Yeah. So I was selling marijuana in school. Mm. That'll, uh, that'll get you kicked out. Yeah, that'll get you, that's <laughs> entrepreneur, right? So uh, I got, I got suspended for a couple of days for selling cards, but yeah, I wasn't selling no. weed. <laughs> yeah. I was selling weed. I got kicked out. I went to an alternative school, which seems really dumb. Like, why would you, everyone that gets kicked out, you put them in the same spot. That just doesn't seem like that's our education <laughs> system. I was like, that doesn't seem smart. Went there for a year. Uh, that was probably the hardest time of my life. And then after that, I went to a Christian school because it's the only place that would take me. Mm. And that's kind of where I was able to meet the Lord. That's where kind of my life really went from going this way to going this way, just because that principle kind of took a chance on, uh, on me. Um, and then from there, yeah, man, graduated high school. Mom gifted me instead of uh, like everyone else gets a car or college or whatever. Mom gave me a mobile home. Well, her equity in a mobile home. She was in partnership on a mobile home with uh, my stepfather at the time. They bought a mobile home together. Um, she gave me, she's like, I own half of that. I, it's all I can give you. I don't have much. Uh, and it comes with a tenant. And I was like, dope. So I bought my stepfather out with the little that I had and moved into it for a year before going to college uh, and just started working. Wow. So yep. tell me about this mobile home. Was it like included with land or was it just a mobile home? Like, and you're renting the lot. Tell me about the deal. Yeah. So the mobile home was on a lot. The rent, the lot rent was 350 and that included the water bill. So my rent to the tenant was 400 bucks. So that covered the, the land lot and the water. So I didn't have any bills. So I've never, this is a cool story. I've never had a mortgage ever. And I own a lot of houses. So wait, the tenant was paying 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. So yep. you're making 50 bucks on it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was that, and that was a light bill. Yeah. So that was it. I was living for free. Uh, since I was 18, I moved out, moved into the mobile home. Oh, the tenant was living with you. Yeah. The tenant was there. Oh, okay. I, I, I was in the master. He was a roommate. He was, yeah. He was a roommate. I was house okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. So he stayed with me. Uh, I knew him as the painter for the longest time. Cause I didn't want to ask him his name. Cause I was like, he's been with me for so long, but I never asked him his name. Super weird. I know. How did you find this guy? So he <laughs> was already in the mobile home when mom gave it to me. Oh, so it was kind of awkward to be like, yo, what's your name? But I guess I should have, but yeah. I literally waited. I'm not kidding. Like four years before I asked him his name. And the reason that was because I was in college or I'm sorry, three years. I was in college for three years. So I would only come home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So I'd only see him on the weekends and I would only see him going out because on the weekends he would go to Alabama to his family. Oh, so we would always just barely cross paths. So I'd never asked him his name. You were like, yo, I'm the, the new sheriff I'm in the town new sheriff. And, and, and we're, we're going to be roomies. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But I don't like, Super don't random. ask me my name. Don't ask me. I won't ask you I yours. Just, just give El me the Dinero. check. That's it, bro. That's <laughs> it. He would pay cash and he would leave it in my in my room and that was it. It was the coolest thing ever. That's probably the weirdest thing ever, but go on. Tell Super me what happened. Super random. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so went to, uh, I mean, after that, he, he stayed with me for a long time. Uh, he's still with me to this day. He's probably paid my mortgages off a couple of times by now. And you know his name. Yeah. His name is Victor. Okay, and in my good. phone, he's like Victor the Painter. Cause he was the painter for so long. So I just ended up putting Victor. In How many years has that been? I mean, what do you, I, mean, you're, I was you're 30, 31. Yeah. I graduated high school in 08. So he's so. been your, your guy for like 13 years. Yeah. Nice. And, yeah. He's been in the longer than some relationships. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Victor, the painter kind of stuck around, uh, went to college, graduated that in three years. Um, just cause I didn't know how to fill out the form. What does so, that mean? Yeah. So when you go to college, <laughs> you get this form that's got six like rows for classes. Yeah. You're so, like, I'm taking 10. No, he, she gave it. She just handed it to me. She said, well, what's your major? Cause I hadn't declared. And I was like, do I have to declare now? And she's like, you don't have to. And I was like, which one doesn't have math? And she goes, sociology. I said, all right, give me that one and I'll change it later. She never changed it. And she was like, okay. So she handed me this yellow piece of paper with six uh, lines on it. And she was like, what classes do you want? And I was like, I get to pick. And she's like, yeah, she's like, you have to pick out of these. I was like, okay. So I just filled out six, mm -hmm. which every class is three hours. It's 18. Yeah. So I took 18 hours every semester 
And here's the other funny thing. I didn't know that you didn't go to college during the summer. <laughs> you kept taking so summer school. So I went school summer too. school too. So I went all year round college. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. So I ended up grad. So did you talk to anybody? Like in school, like you didn't talk to the painter. Did you just you said didn't like <laughs> you didn't talk to any of your students who are like, hey fool, why are you taking so many classes? Like what you're taking summer too? Like summer, what right? what what year are you? And you're like, I there's a year? Like what are you talking about? I don't know. Yeah, I, I really Did you did know it. what being a freshman was? Mm -mm. You gotta remember, like I was my mom didn't know college. Yeah. And it wasn't something we talked about in high school. I was kicked out in high school. I was worried about just graduating. Yeah. So it wasn't. Why did you even go to college? Like, what made you? I had an ex girlfriend that was like, hey, you should probably do this. And I'm like, uh, really? I just thought you'd go to work. And she's like, no. She's like, I'll help you fill out the forms. I said, all right, dope. Okay. And that was <laughs> it. So she believed in me. So I went uh, and I filled out 16, 16 lines, which is 18 hours every semester. Uh, and then I remember the last time I went to go fill out that form again, the lady was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's it. That's all you graduated. You graduated in December. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, you actually. The reason you're you're here for the meeting is not to fill out more, is to fill out your graduation papers. And I was like, that's it. She's like, that's it. Three years. I was like, what? People were like, I'm a second some second year senior or something, and I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. that's ridiculous. <laughs> so, and here's the other part. So, my mom didn't know that you got loans for college, so we paid for college cash. Right. Just because, again, and like we just didn't know what we didn't know. FAFSA loans, like all that. We we didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, and you would have probably qualified for a lot of those things. Oh, for free, for sure. I was in the South. I'm Mexican. I mean, I <laughs> yeah, you would have got better, every dude. diversity. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I would have got it all. So, yeah, it's just kind of one of those things like we didn't know. So you you ended up getting a sociology degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ended up getting a sociology with an emphasis in uh, criminal justice and then a double in Spanish. But Spanish was just uh, six months of test taking. So they gave me a double major. Huh. I just thought it was part of the course. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's crazy, yeah. man. And, uh, I guess what's crazy about that story, other than the story itself is crazy, but also you're like, nah, I don't want math, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're in business and, you know, financial education stuff where it's like, this is all math. Uh, yeah, yes and no, actually. So I follow what I call the Burger King model. Uh, so I have business partners that help me with the math part because I, I, I legit, like I do know, obviously, but I just not my strength. And I, in my, in Rat Race Defy, I talk a lot about strengths and weaknesses. Um, and like, don't try to sharpen your weaknesses, but focus on your strengths. Okay. Um, and I tell a lot of people, like, I just, I just really do the Burger King model, which is like, if I see two people bought a cabin on this street and the third one's for sale, guess what I'm doing? I'm buying that third cabin. Felipe, are you running comps? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? I mean, as unprofessional as it sounds, it's like, nope. If I know these two people bought these two cabins and they're crushing it and I trust them and I believe in them, I'm going to buy that third cabin. So I just kind of follow what Burger King does to McDonald's. Right. Well, I don't know if I believe that strategy too well, but uh, as long as you have somebody double checking you, then uh, you're good. Good. All right. As long as you got, he just, for those of you who are listening, he just pointed to one of his partners who's off camera. So yeah, like I'm, I'm with you on things where I know I don't have an expertise. Um, trying to think of one off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> just know too many things just, apparently <laughs> you're too smart no so i just put people in the place where i'm not the best at yeah and i've put myself where i'm only for example with me i'm only sales and everything else position that i know that i'm not good at either hire a partner yeah for sure and that that's the same way i operate it's like dude this is why you're in the business like i don't know how to do this nor do i want to i could definitely do it but it's going to take me 10 hours when it could take you five minutes. Exactly. hundred percent agree with that. So for sure, you got to know your strengths and weaknesses. So you end up, uh, you know, graduating. What happens next? Yeah. So I graduated, um, the mobile home. What I was like, I'm not going to go back to a mobile home. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I was like, it's time to upgrade. Ended up fixing it up just a little bit. I asked, uh, Victor, the painter, if he'll paint it for me. So, we, <laughs> so it looks a little bit better. And then I ended up selling it for 10 grand and I used that as a down payment for my first single family. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ended up asking Victor to come with me again. So he came with me to the single family home and rented a room in that house for a long time too. This is all in uh, Nashville? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So you ended up, what year was this? Like how old were you? Oh you man, so home? I graduated in 2012. So uh, 18, 19, uh, 23, 22. So 23, you bought your first home. Mm -hmm. And then um, how many do you own today? Uh, wow. Okay. Um, uh, like 32 doors, 32 doors. Like that. Yeah. Nice. And so are you mainly just trying to acquire rentals? Or are you guys wholesaling? You flipping? What are you doing? Yeah. So I have flipped some homes, but I usually just flip to fund, uh, like long-term investments. 
Um, so I first wanted to reach five. Like that was my biggest goal. I was like, how do I just get rid of all of my expenses? Figured out what that number was. And I just bought enough cash flow producing houses to do that. Uh, so we got nine or 10 of those to fund like basically my life. And then from there, it's just been investing in like either a 16 unit apartment complex that we have in Augusta, Georgia, or short term rentals, which my business partner calls just like your money machine of, of businesses, mm. some more like uh, risky investment, short term rentals and things like that. Nice. I wanted to like get my basis first, which was, you know, reaching five. Nice, dude. We're we're Georgia buddies now. <laughs> yeah, that's where my apartment is now. Oh, dope. OK. Yeah, we uh, we closed on the 134 units in Warner Robins, Georgia. OK. And we're closing on 200 more. Probably by the time this airs, we'll have closed on it. Good so. for you. We'll have 334 Warner Robins, Georgia. Um, quick plug, if anybody wants to invest, Pineda Capital, you guys can uh, invest with us on our next deal. But uh, you know what's funny about this uh, FI? I call it FI or FI. FI what do yeah. people call it? FI? FI, yeah, just so, FI, reaching FI. Okay, reaching FI. So here's a funny thing about this story. Oh, God. Um, so when I was doing YouTube, when I first started last year, I was like looking up... Um, Topics that people talk about and everything, right? And then um, I see this whole thing with, like, this fire movement. And I'm like, what the heck is fire? Like, is it the fire festival? Like, what is going on with this? And I, yeah, I, I still don't even know what it's, it's like so it's financial. Independence. What's the RE? Uh, no idea. Retire early? Oh, retire early. Retire yeah, yeah. Early. Okay, yeah. so that makes sense. no idea how I remember that. Yeah, so I see this fire thing, and I was like, huh, I've never once thought about this. Like, I just didn't care. And yeah. then, um, you know, so I look at it, I'm like, I'm probably just going to do a video talking about how this is stupid. Like, just, <laughs> just to be a contrarian and probably yeah. get, like, well, not to say it's stupid, but just to be like, hey, I became successful not thinking about this. Right. Right? right. Like, it just happened naturally by pursuing other things. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people, you know, pursue phi, like you call it. And, um, you know, so whatever I, I, I learned about fire. I'm like, okay, whatever. So then, um, I see somebody else mentioned just FI mm -hmm. and I was like, huh? And I was like, this is like a whole movement. Mm -hmm. And then, um, bigger pockets reached out to me about, um, writing a forward for a FI book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm like, okay, uh, I don't know that I'm the best guy for this because I'm just like all about just like, Hey, just make money. Like and yeah. the rest will come. Right. And, um, but here we are. And, and here uh, we are. here we are. I'm a FI expert. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, it's funny. I wish I would have, uh, known the different aspects of real estate before just focusing on FI because I reached financial independence and that's got a huge, like whatever plaque tag or something to it. But there's not like, it's not the lifestyle you want to live. Like you still want to have money to play with you can't give big if you're just fine. You can't bless others if you're just fine. Cause you're only really just worried about like your stuff. Right. So once I reached five, I was like, okay, this is dope. I don't have to like go to work, but I'm not able to like tithe better or I'm not able to give others as I want to or so forth and so on. Or live a more crazy life or live a, yeah. Or, yeah. or, or buy the Tesla that I want or, yeah. you know, all these other things. So I was like, I need, I need to, to build my, my, my cash machine. Like my business partner, Diego calls it. Uh, and then that's kind of where I was like, okay, well, at least I've reached five so I can be a little bit more risky. Yeah. And I remember, you know, the first concept I had of five was reading rich dad, poor dad. Mm. And, um, it, they just, I don't think he used that term of fire or fi. It was just, right. Hey, become financially free and you know, whatever Buy buy assets, don't buy liabilities, whatever. And I remember sitting there when I read it, I think I was 24 first time I read it. And I was like, huh? That's a pretty good concept. Mm. Like, just get rental property. Like, seriously, up to 24, and I'm a pretty smart guy. Like, I had a college degree. Uh, in Doesn't mean a lot, because yeah, I got one. True, true. <laughs> but I had an economics degree oh, where, never mind. where you okay. think I should have heard a lot of these things. Right. But I was just, like, worried about baseball. There you go. And, you know, is the first time I really thought about it. I go, that is a novel idea. Like, I think that's that's uh, something cool. And then it was just gone. I was like, eh, whatever. Like, mm. eh, it'll happen. And then I also, during that time, read the four hour work week for the first time. And it was a different way of saying it where he was like, hey, have a business where you work four hours a week and it just pays you while you're not working. Like you, you built this machine that prints money. And I remember at 21, when I read um, that book, 
I started thinking, I'm like, what could be a good business? Like what's an invention that I could really monetize? And you know, once again, it was a good idea, but never did anything with it. Cause I'm like, I don't, I don't know, dude, baseball's it. Like if I don't make it in baseball, I don't know what I'm going to do. Right. And, um, eventually as I've seen my life grow, it's funny to look back on those things and say like, man, like I ended up doing those things. I made businesses where I don't spend a lot of time on them and they do make money and they don't need me. And then, you know, I did buy rentals and these things to, you know, basically fund my lifestyle, right. but it was never a goal. Mm. It was just like, I'm going to pursue this. It's fun. It's smart to do, but I don't know that I was ever trying to achieve Phi. Um, it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened. That makes sense. So for us, uh, the reason I, I, I like got into like this kind of method was, um, I read a book. I can't remember what book it was right now, but it was like, or maybe it was bigger pockets where they were like, Oh, a hundred to $200 a door is great. Yeah. And I, I was like, I complete. I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't get out of bed for 30 days for a hundred bucks. Like it no. just doesn't seem like something I'd want to do. So I thought that was like, I was like, that, that's not what I'm doing at all. So like when I buy the, the rental properties that kind of sustain our lifestyle, if they don't make, you know, six, $700 a month cash flow and some, uh, it's probably not something that we're going to buy. So when I heard a hundred bucks, I was like, man, that's going to take me years to reach five. That's like an unreachable goal. So my goal was like, I got to squeeze out as much as I can out of, out of every single house before I even move on to the next one, which is how nine, 10 homes, like basically retired us. Just house hacking, mm -hmm. Airbnb, just stuff yeah, like that. Just what does every, I believe every property has like a max that you can do with it, whether it's in a, in a great Airbnb area, or it's great for like my niche with my homes is the traveling construction workers. So Nashville is, you know, growing by leaps and bounds. And these construction companies will bring helpers from other States and they got a, somewhere to live for a year. Yeah. Uh, and they get a stipend for hotel or whatever. And I'm just like, Hey, you guys can stay with us. It's 500 bucks a room. I have you know six rooms in a house, three upstairs, three downstairs. So we're maximizing the cash flow on every house. Yeah. No, we, um, we actually did that on a couple of my big bear Airbnbs during the pandemic last year because they wouldn't let us do short term rentals mm -hmm. and, uh, for whatever, a few months and I'm like, well, okay, you know, what are we going to do? And Pivot. then, <laughs> yeah, one of my realtors was like, Hey, I know that this construction company, they need housing for their people. They're building something here in big bear. I was like, great. How long do they need it for? And she's like three months. I'm like, great. You know, it's. I don't remember what I charged them. Like maybe it was like five grand a month or something. Cause it's fully furnished, right, right. you know, it has all Everything. that stuff. And, uh, they agreed to it. And I was like, Oh, okay. That was cool. You know, I, I, I might've made more doing it, you know, daily short-term rentals versus a whole month, but it was way less headache. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, one time, cool peace. And I've seen a couple of my students do that, um, at future flipper where, here in Vegas, short-term rentals are outlawed as of now. I think really? that's going to change probably next year. They've already talked about how it's kind of illegal that they did that. Um, and, you know, I get it. The hotels, they want you on the strip. They don't For want sure. Airbnbs. For sure. So, you know, a lot of them are, well, not a lot, but a few of them are doing just furnished long-term rentals. And it's like you can double the rent. You know, something that I could have got 2000 for, I can get five. Right. Or, you know, if I just furnish it for them and what's right. furnishing house costs cost me 10 grand. Maybe. Yeah. And that furniture I already know from Airbnb will last quite a while if I buy the right one. So, you know, there, there's like, you're talking about ways to truly maximize every property. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what, that's what we look to do. We look at a property and we're going to buy it. And it's like, what's the best way to do this? STR rent by the room. Are we splitting it top half, bottom half? Are we adding washer and dryers? We just, we maximize a property before we like move on to the next one, if you will. Yeah. What else can we get out of this one? That's it. All right, dope. Let's set up the systems for it. Move on to the next one. Yeah. Well, you know that I love that. And I think it's a great way to do more with less mm -hmm. and you have less headache, um, with less properties. Right. So totally love that. Um, I kind of want to transition a little bit and talk about something you just said of like, you know, achieving Phi is great, but man, if you're just only trying to achieve, you know, whatever that five minimum is and that's it, like to me, it's kind of selfish. Right. So I want to talk about that. But before we do that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. Have you ever wanted to invest in real estate, but you didn't have the time to find deals yourself? That's where Fundrise comes in. 
Fundrise is a crowdfunding platform that has transacted over $5 billion in real estate and has over 150,000 active investors. While many funds, like my own, require accredited investors, Fundrise allows anyone to invest with as little as $500. If you'd like to learn more, check out Fundrise.com. Once again, that's Fundrise.com. A quick word from our sponsor. One of the best ways to get off-market real estate deals is through cold calling. And if you want to reach as many people as fast as possible, then you need Batch Dialer. With their predictive dialing technology and built-in CRM, Batch Dialer is one of the top dialers in the industry. You can switch between single or multi-line dialing, as well as do voicemail drops and call recordings. And for being a listener of The Ryan Pineda Show, you'll get a seven-day free trial. Just go to batchdialer.com slash Ryan. Once again, that's batchdialer.com slash Ryan. Now, back to the show. So, yeah, I've thought about this concept a lot with retirement. And I see a lot of people saying, well, I want to retire early so I can travel the world and do this. And, you know, as long as I make whatever, 5000 a month in passive income, 10000 a month in passive income, I'm good. I'll live off that forever and I'm chilling. And I hear that and I'm like, man, for one, I don't want to live that life because 10000 ain't as much as you think it is, for one. And getting 10000 in FI is tough, right? But two, I'd get bored, dude. I'm not trying to go travel the world, like maybe for a period of time, but definitely not the rest of my life. Um, and three, it's just kind of a waste of my talent and abilities that God has given me if I just am like, all right, I'm out, I'm just doing my thing. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. I think just reaching FI is really cutting yourself short and almost like not taking advantage of those talents that you were given. Uh, so I completely agree. If you just get FI, then, I mean, you're, you're cutting yourself short because if you reached FI, I know that you can go past that and you just have to keep doing what you're doing and adding to it. I was at a dinner uh, in Georgia the other day and one of our business partners was like, man, Felipe, you're closing on deals all the time. Uh, you know, when is enough enough? And I get what he, what kind of trap he was trying to put me in, right? He was like, are you being greedy or whatever? And I told him, I was like, man, if I want to give right, give often uh, and die broke, then I, I'm i not like continuously working. I'm just building for systems to be able to plug and play. Earlier, we were talking about just, uh, you know, reaching FI and, and the homes that we, we did it with. I always tell my mentees, I want the least amount of properties with the most amount of cash flow. That doesn't give me like just a certain amount of houses. Like I can have a hundred homes if that's what it's going to take, but I, I just want to maximize every single one and use the abilities that God's given me to benefit others if I can as well. And like you said, just reaching five for myself is selfish because it's just me and it's like, okay. Everyone else is, you know, screwed, but I have the talents to help other people. Yeah. And if I'm not, my mentor gave it to me like this. He said, Felipe, you can't help no one if you're not rich. And it's true because even on an airplane, you put your mask on first. He goes, if, if you want to help people, you, you got to get to that point, yeah. right? Where you can put your mask on, you're taken care of, and now you can bless other people. Now, rich is obviously, you know, different for different people and where you live. A anyone can, can start helping now, but if you really want to make an impact, it takes money. Yeah, for sure. Does. Well, and like you said, too, you, you got to be taking care of yourself, right? Sure. If your body is broken and, you know, you're not healthy, how are you going to expect to go help people at a massive level? Um so there, there's even more to it than just money, right? And it's funny because uh, Christian, one of your partners here, asked me that at golf yesterday. Not not as a, like a leading question, but maybe just out of pure curiosity of like, when's enough enough? And, you know, people have asked me this many times, and I'm like, dude, probably never. Yeah. Um, I just... I agree. I don't do it for just like this goal of having more money or more fi or whatever like dude it i had i was very happy when i was flipping couches um i wanted more i always wanted to like achieve more but financially man i had a great house man 1500 square foot house me and my wife we were doing good um i was super proud of where we were at and um i would have never imagined whatever we're on our eighth year of marriage that we'd be where we're at today. There's mm -hmm. no way you could have told me that in eight years we'd be where we're at. And it's just like, I'm playing to me, I'm playing with house money at this point. Like, dude, I'm good. I know that even if I tried to not do anything else to this point and just basically coasted, coasted. it's like better than 
anything I would have ever imagined. But that's just boring. Yeah, it's a waste. Uh, it's a waste of your talent, and and you're obviously put on this earth for a lot more. And it, and it's like not doing anyone anyone favor for you to just coast. Yeah, because there's how many people could you have helped? And I mean, uh, you know, a lot of your listeners are probably know the story in the Bible, but you know, one day you're going to be asked to give, you know, your your tokens. I gave you something. What'd you do with it? Did you just right. hide it? Yeah, you know, or did you give back? So so that's huge on my heart all the time as well. It's like what I know, I have to give it back, which is why we have Rat Race to Fi. Yeah, because we want to be able to help others reach that financial independence and then, you know, be able to live those lives that they want. Right. Yeah. I think um, back to the Bible verse where Paul is talking about how he's running the race um, literally until he dies. Like he's just running the race nonstop and he'll take a break when he dies because, you know, our time on this earth is super limited in comparison to eternity. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, man, am I really that lazy that? I can't spend this limited time on earth, like working and doing whatever it takes to, you know, bring God glory, to use my talents the best way possible, to help other people, to take care of my family, to leave a legacy, to like do all these things in such a very short amount of time that I have. And I think people just maybe think they have longer than they anticipate. And so they procrastinate or they, you know, whatever. So, I also have a podcast, so I had a question or two for you as well, if that's cool. If not, yeah. your editor can cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> it will be in. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a conversation on the golf course, and it's important to me. I've asked you two things quite a bit. I've asked you about how to keep up with your tithes, because that's something that's hard for us on our end. Right. But the second one was, and I asked you yesterday, I was like, how do you and your wife, Mindy, um, like, how do you how do you coordinate with time? Because, like, you know, we talk a lot about helping others, giving back but we're also, you know, uh, given the responsibility of our wives. So how do you give her the time plus everything else that you do and everyone that's tugging at Ryan Pineda, how do you make sure that, you know, your spouse has that time that she deserves? Yeah. So to answer your first question about tithing, um, I have asked you that before. Yeah. Somebody else on the golf course asked me that too. Um, been randomly doing these golf with Ryan days that have been a hit. So, I don't even really advertise it that much, but you it's, should. It's fun. I, I, yeah. I had a great time. Yeah. So if you're listening, <clears throat> definitely go hit some golf with uh, Ryan. Yeah. We don't even have a product page for anything. So I guess uh, just DM me on Instagram if you want to golf with me. There's different things we do. But um, he asked me the same thing. He goes, how do you tithe with all these businesses and everything? I go, for me, I since I have my own tax company, um, I get a statement around the 10th of the following month of kind of what all the businesses did the previous month and what the net was and everything else. And I'll just tithe based on that net amount for, you know, however well we did in business. And, you know, it just keeps it simple. Just one time a month. It's accurate. I don't have to guess. It's like, this is the number, you know? So like, let's go on that. So that's how I do the tithe. Um, as far as, um, time with Mindy and, uh, just family and everything Mm -hmm. like that. Um, you were asking me because we golfed on Labor Day. You're like, how'd you get out here on Labor Day? Um, and then I saw her post on Instagram. <laughs> I know. So she, she's funny. She, uh, she'll she dog me. She don't care. You know, it's fun. Um, but even like, you know, so I, we went golfing. We had fun. And then I took her out, you know, after that to a nice dinner. Oh, okay. And, you know, we had a good time. Um, somebody else asked me that too last Friday because they were like, dude, you, I saw you, you worked out this morning. You you know, you did some business stuff, then you golfed with us. And then now you're about to go and, you know, go have date night with your wife. Like, do you ever stop? And I'm like, no, I don't need to stop. Like for me, I just enjoy everything that I'm doing. I enjoy to work. I enjoy golfing. I enjoy hanging out with my wife. Like I literally only do things I enjoy. And so if I, if I get joy doing it, then, um, it's not work. Yeah. Like I have energy. It energizes me. It doesn't drain me. And so I think you got to look at the things in your life that, um, bring you joy. And, um, if, if for, and here's, unfortunately, here's the truth. A lot of entrepreneurs and business people, they, they find a lot of joy in making money and working. And so they want to just like only do that. And then kind of coming back to the family is like a burden to them. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I gotta go. I have to go home. Yeah. I gotta go home and you know, I gotta go, you know, these kids and, you know, my wife's nagging at me and I would rather, I mean, this is the truth. And then, you know, I'd rather be at work where everybody like is with me. It's, you know, camaraderie and we're, we're making money and 
all this stuff. And so then we start to tell ourselves lives where we're like, oh, well, I'm doing this for my wife. When in reality, you're, you're doing it for you. So I would say for me, um, knowing that I just enjoy hanging out with my family. Um, if somebody tugs at me to do something, I'm just like, nah, like I, I have no problem saying no. Took me a while to get to, to hang out with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just Buddy, like oh, a good half a year. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'll I'll say no like the whole. I just don't care. I'm like, dude, I, I I'm not obligated to anybody for anything right. in my life. So it's just like, look, I I get that you know, whatever it is you want to do, like I understand that it's important to you, but I don't have an obligation to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and my obligation is to the things I've committed to in my life. I've committed to my wife long-term There you go. There <laughs> till you go. death do us part. Yeah. You know, I had these kids. I'm stuck with I'm them. Stuck with them. <laughs> yeah. So like I'm committed to these no matter what. Yeah. Um, my businesses, I'm pretty committed to them. I, I created them. I've got employees. We've got Mark. We've got all these things. Right. And so I look at my commitments and I say, okay, these are my commitments and uh, these are the requirements for these commitments. Mm -hmm. And so I know with each business, hey, I got to dedicate this many hours to this business. If I cannot do that, then I need to either remove myself from the business further or I need to sell the business. I need to stop the business, whatever, because it's just not run the right way where I can give it the proper attention it needs. Right. Same thing with family, you know, it's like, all right, we have to have an, not an agreement, but an understanding. (laughs) I'll get my wife to sign a contract. (laughs) I will spend, you know, 30 hours a week with you. No, but like, we have to have an understanding of like, Hey, here's on weekends, you're with the family at Mm -hmm. nights, you're with the family, you know? And we just have that understanding of what it is. And we're both very happy with it. And then it allows me to go do the rest of the stuff that, you know, I want to do. Nice. Yeah. So I guess it sounds like it's just time management. Like you make sure that every position in your life and in, in, in contract, I guess you could say, uh, has its time in place. Well, that and um, you have to also realize when it comes to time, what time can actually be sold to somebody else. And so take, for instance, getting deals. Um before I used to spend a lot of time going and hunting deals mm-hmm. for the company, right? Cause I was good at it. I enjoyed it. I love the thrill of getting a deal the hunt. Yeah. I love it. And, um, eventually though, I realized I don't need to do this. I could easily like let somebody else do that. Right. I could, you know, get that time back or I don't need, I, I said, sell the time, but I guess buy the time buy back. The time, yeah. You know, I'm going to pay this guy to do this for me instead. And I started to realize that in all aspects of my life, I was like, what? what could actually be bought back Mm. and pay someone else to do it? And what truly requires me now, when I think about, um, the aspects of my life, it's very simple. What truly requires me? Um, I have to go work out. I have to put in the work myself. I've got to read the books myself. No one can do it for me. I've got to attend the seminars to an extent myself. If I want to go learn, um, I could send someone on my behalf and try and consolidate it and say, give me the top five bullet points you learned. Right you know, something like that. But, um, for the most part, it's like any self-development is pretty much all you, um, family time. It's all me. There's no substitute Ryan. (laughs) I can go send for the family. If you're not careful. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, you know, can you go hang out with my family for a little bit? So, you know, I know that, okay, I can't sub that out. Great. So I kind of just take what I know for certain I need to do and cannot sub out. Mm -hmm. And that gives me already my baseline. Then the rest is like, all right, Here's like my variable. Here's how many hours I can actually play with and manipulate and figure out what I want to do with. Right. Mold the clay. And there will be times in my life where it's super skewed. Maybe I'm starting a new business and I'm like using all of that bucket of time to start that business. And then everything else is kind of taking a back seat. Mm. It may or may not do as good because I'm not involved. And it's just is what it is. Right. You know, it's just a sacrifice I got to make to get this going. Great example of that was when I started social media and YouTube. I was like, hey, I am going to take away from doing deals. We are going to get less deals because I'm just not going to be involved anymore. I accept that in pursuit of this. Of a bigger thing. Yeah. And um, thankfully it worked out. Right. But uh, that was a decision and a very, there's always a trade off. When you choose to do something with your time, something else gets taken away. Unfortunately, though, most will take from, the other buckets. Right. They're their like core buckets, their family. Their, yeah, yeah. They'll take from that. Cause they'll be like, well, you know, I, I still want to maintain these and, but I also want to get this going. So 
uh, I don't want to take from these. Let me take from, you know, yeah. this other an hour from my family's yeah. time versus I like the way you put that where you said, you know, it's like you, you took away a little way away from your business, a little less money. But knowing you're you're going to put that time somewhere else, it's not like I'm going to take away from my family to add more here. And then before you know it, you're working 12, 13 hour days and, you know, li leaving your family behind. Yeah, because I think <clears throat> a lot of people only think of time in terms of dollars. And so and, and that's kind of the way that we view opportunity cost is time and money. And so they're like, well, you know, hang on, my family does not make me any money. Right. So let me take an hour from there so I can go make, you know, a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks here. And it's just it, the time that you spend on your health, your family with God and those things have infinitely more value than you can even put a dollar sign on oh, 100%. It. So when I look at that and I'm like, okay, on the weekends when I'm just hanging with my family and stuff, um, people would say, well, the opportunity cost is you could be working and making, you know, whatever you could have made $20,000. You could have got a deal. And I'm like, nah, cause I just gained like, if you want to put dollars on it, millions in emotional value, in mental and, you know, spiritual and all these other things that I choose to spend time on that right. you just can't even put a dollar figure on. For sure. No, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think that's why we have Rat Race to Fi as well, because we've seen a lot of that happens a lot in the Latino community and the minority community where you spend a lot of time away from your family. Uh, to make money to feed your family but then you know as we grow up like for example me I didn't really grow up a lot with my dad because he's always working right so like if my dad would have been five maybe I would have had more time with him maybe the divorce wouldn't even have happened right right so that's what ha that that that's the that's that's what happens if people don't you know uh educate themselves financially like you've already obviously already done so you know how to keep your marriage strong your business strong you know how to keep all those things strong because you give them time right yeah. so that's why we have rat race for things like that that we're like we know that we can help marriages. We know that we can help uh, people's businesses. We know that we can help people have better relationships. Um, and that's kind of like the Trojan horse of rat race, right? Like, yeah, we want you to reach five, but we know that it comes with way more things than just financial independence. Right. You're going to be able to give back to your kids better, back to your family better. You're going to be just a better person if you have your time back. Right. As long as you use five properly. Correct. Exactly. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And that's part of what we talk about a lot. Yeah. No, I love that, dude. It's kind of my message as well. Um, I just don't really have a name for it. I just talk about it. <laughs> I was like, guys, this is how you should live. Like, I we, think we branded it. We, we put yeah, it into it. I like we, it. <laughs> I should have did. Well, I have my raise, you know, planner and all those things. But uh, we'll sell it to you. We'll sell it to you. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. You know, speaking of selling and, and scaling and other things, man. Um, yeah. One thing we also talked about on the golf course was partners um, in these businesses. Yeah. And um I know you own a few businesses, you've got partners and mm -hmm. you know, most of these businesses in my businesses, I've got partners as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think about partners, man? What's your take? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, because when I first started, I, I was, you know, big macho. I can do this on my own. I can do everything by myself. Um, and I would find myself going as hard and as fast as I can, but there's only so far that I could go. So there's, there's two big partnerships that I have. Uh, and then there's a lot of little ones from there, but uh, rat race to fi with my business partner, Diego Corzo, uh, and then one hour work week with, uh, Steve and Christian, my e-commerce business partners. Um, so those are my two big partnerships. And, and I would tell people like, if you can just work on your strengths, you're going to be happy if, and that's why I partner because I want to be able to just do what I'm good at. And then if my business partner compliments the things that I can't do or don't want to, cause they're better at it then the it's 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 gonna go exponentially farther there's a book called rocket fuel that my business partner gave me to read yeah great and it book. just puts so many things into perspective as like why i can't stand an excel sheet but i love to jump on the phone and and make connections you know it's how i got here yeah you know diego my business partner would probably have like how do i you know say something to ryan on, on dm or something i'm like bro just say hi like yeah whatever you know and that's just who i am so i think partnerships are great when you're scaling when you're taking down deals I, I know very little, very successful people that have gone far by themselves. Very yeah. little, if any, actually. Right. And I'll tell you, for me, when I got started, I was going kind of, I guess, kind of the anti-partner route. Like, I was just doing my own thing. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to flip couches on my own. Started out flipping houses on my own. I'm like, dude, pretty successful by myself. Right. Like, I don't really need to do anything else. Now, granted, I started hiring employees. I was going to say, so you went the hiring route, though. Yep. So... 
I won't cut you off, but yeah, either you partner or you hire. That's right. what I was, that was the next thing that I was going to say. So, sorry. Yeah. To you off. Yeah. So I started hiring people and, um, it drastically changed my business, right? Like I, I hired people and we just started to scale and grow quickly. Um, but then I realized too, in a lot of these businesses, it's better to have a partner who has equity and their interests are aligned. Um, if you both are the visionary and the integrator. So, you know, in all my businesses, I'm the visionary. Um, this is a term from rocket fuel that, um, Felipe was just talking about. And, you know, I'm the guy that comes up with ideas. I'm the guy who's leading the charge. I am, you know, closing big deals, doing the things we got to do. The integrator is the person who is running the day to day. Mm -hmm. And, all of my businesses, you can tell, I don't run the day-to-day -day in these businesses. Somebody is behind the scenes running it. Right. And every single one of my integrators, whether we're you know, legally partners in the LLC or not, has some type of revenue share. That's you know? so important. Yeah, because we, I want our goals incentivized together of like, hey, you know, we're both, what's the end goal of this? To, to make as much net profit as possible, right, in a business. And um, I want you watching the expenses like a hawk. I want you watching our revenue like a hawk. That way we are both aligned. Right. So totally agree on that, dude. Yeah, partnerships are a great way for people even to, you know, if you're in a position where you feel like you hit a wall. And I actually asked you this on the golf course the other day. Uh, and I try to take advantage of every situation that I'm in. So I'll ask you the question here for the listeners because I think it's going to add some value. Um, you know, I asked you, when I was when I was spanking you out there on the golf course, I said, <laughs> he, he most certainly wasn't, guys. But by the way, before he tells the story, this guy, he's oh, like, here dude, we go. he was so hyped to do the podcast. He's like, dude, like, let's golf. You know, I see you're doing it with everybody. You know, want to golf? And I'm like, you know, I wasn't planning to. It's Labor Day, but they're about to reseed. Today is literally the last day that the Look course is God. open. And I was like whatever let's golf and he's talking all this crap he's like i'm getting lessons and also too this guy is critiquing my swing because i'm <laughs> i'm i'm posting on ig like i'm putting in the work i'm getting lessons i'm developing and uh he's like yeah 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 swing looks good oh that swing didn't look too good you know i had no idea what i was talking about yeah i'm like this freaking guy whatever <laughs> and so then um i'm looking at his swing because he's posting it like he's at the range like every day or something i'm like <laughs> this guy must be serious, but his swing still sucks. And so he comes to the, the course and it was even worse in person, Terrible. but nonetheless. Terrible. Well, <laughs> again, it's a Trojan horse. My goal was to have our e-commerce uh, expert, Steve, golf with you. I was just the way to get in. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Steve wasn't able to make it. Shout out to my boy. He got COVID. So he had to stay home, but that was a real thing there. And then we, me and me and Christian, his <laughs> right hand, we were like, Oh God, what are we going to do? I was like, I don't know, dude. Right now we just got to risk it for the biscuit. The conversation better be great to hold <laughs> his attention. Yeah. No, it was a good conversation, but, uh, it was fun. So but, yeah, my, I, I would probably give up golf. If I was you. Yeah, uh, you see how Ryan, no, yeah, yeah I agree. Hey, it got <laughs> the job done. Stick with what you're done. good at, right? Stick with <laughs> what you're good at. Strengths and weaknesses. We yeah. just talked about it, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll stick to real estate. <laughs> um, no. So my question to you on the golf course was, um, you know, how do you get to that next level? People making $50,000 a year that want to get that six figure mark. People that are making two, 300,000 that want to get to that millionaire a year mark. Like right. what is, um, uh, and I, I have the answer, but I definitely want our listener, or I'm sorry, your listeners to, to get this answer. Cause it was crucial for me. It's probably one of the biggest things that I'm taking away from this weekend or a week. What and how do you go to that next level? Cause there's levels. Right. Right. So. I think there are multiple steps and everybody's steps are different um, in terms of how they start getting what I call the exponential growth, right? Because I think you see people who are like, okay, they, they make a hundred thousand and then they're like, well, I want to, okay, this year the goal is 150, 200, right? And then maybe the next year's goal, maybe they hit 150 or 175 and they're like, okay, this year 250. And they, they kind of have like these small incremental goals. And I think they're kind of boxing themselves in to whatever it is the current way they make money and they're just trying to have little increments of improvement on how they currently make money. And what I have seen with exponential growth is two different ways. One is taking how you currently make money, but then just trying to explode it. And the only way you can explode it is through hiring and marketing. There it is. And that's what we talked about on the course. You know, you were like, how do I, you know, 
get more revenue and do these things. I'm like, well, you got to market, you know, you're not marketing enough. You got to get more people aware of your business. You got to get more people aware of you. You got to get more, you know, leads, whatever it is. Like that's the only way to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the house flipping business, that's, you know, marketing to sellers, that's networking with wholesalers, networking with realtors, find more ways to get deals. Once you do that and your marketing's on point, you get a new problem. How do I manage all this new business? How do I handle it with operations? And so the only way to do that is to hire. And, you know, you're going to learn, you're going to have your bumps and bruises along the way with scaling and, you know, systems and processes and things breaking and messiness. It still happens to me all the time in every new business because you're always in new uncharted territory. Um, and that's kind of the problem with growth is that you're never fully like stabilized ever because if I go and hire a couple of people, cause I'm short, right? Great. I filled it. We're good now, but then I want to grow again. And so now we're short again. And then I want to grow again. Mm. Now I want to spend more money. Oh, now we're just vastly more complex than we were before. We need another layer of management mm -hmm. above these guys. So like, you know, in your one current business, you, it really is just marketing and hiring as, as terms of how you start getting exponential growth instead yeah. of, you know, like <clears throat> give a, a good example for realtors here. Cause we get a lot of realtors who listen. Okay. Maybe you make $200,000 as a solo realtor. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. You're, you're like, I want to make 300 next year. You could for sure probably make 300 next year by yourself. By yourself yeah. Can you continuing doing whatever it is you're doing? Right. But the moment you ask yourself and say, how do I want to make a million? Probably not doing it by yourself. Okay. Probably what's going to happen is you're going to start thinking, okay, how am I going to get more leads? I don't have enough clients. So you might say, well, I'm going to take social media seriously. I'm going to, you know, start putting more content out there, trying to draw more leads to us. I'm going to buy Zillow ads. I'm going to door knock. I'm going to, you know, cold call. I'm going to do just like these things that I don't do before, but you yourself probably can't do them because you only have so much time. You're going to mm -hmm. have to pay somebody else to cold call somebody else to door knock Zillow for leads, you know, whatever you do to, to generate those leads. But then now that you've got all those leads, you're like, I can't show this many houses. I can't go on this many listing appointments. So you're going to go hire um, a showing agent. Yeah. You're going to go hire a transaction coordinator. You're going to hire all these guys. And sure enough, with this new game plan, you can do a million. No doubt about it. <clears throat> but most people don't want to think to that level. They would rather right. just, how do I increase what I already do? I don't want to like overcomplicate this. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big thing that I took away from the golf course yesterday was, um, you know, you, you have to advertise, you have to put yourself out there and you have to hire because you're going it, to, it's going to give you a return and you got to take care of it. So I think that was, that was the biggest thing for me. Uh, and for your listeners, man, if they can get you on the golf course, they need to do it. <laughs> they do because, I mean, you drop some nuggets out there. I appreciate um, that, dude. But I think it's just who you are. So, And I knew that. You know, I want to surround myself with people that do, do things like that and, and just ooze that, like, success, uh, if you if you would say, and then just have nuggets. So that was that was big. I was like, man, I, I'm definitely going to take that and, and implement that. So yeah. so appreciate that for sure. Yeah. The other thing, um, you know, like I said, there's, there's, that's one way to do it how to just scale that existing or scale that existing business. But the other way to do it is have multiple businesses. And so, you know, you said you've got multiple things going on. You got real estate, you've got your um, rat race group, you've got e-commerce, you know? So for me, everyone knows I've got a ton of businesses and um, I'm simultaneously scaling all these things right. at once. Some are more focused on than others, right? Not all of them can have my complete attention. In fact, the ones that usually get my most attention are the ones that have the best opportunity in front of them, right? Like, Hey, if I put more effort into this, it's going to make a lot more money than putting effort into this. Right. So I tend to focus on those ones. And you know, when you start seeing all these seeds you've planted throughout the years start to really grow, the exponential stuff starts really kicking in because, you know, I've had future flipper for since 2018, you know, so we're going on four years. Right. Um, it's now like hitting stride, like extremely good. You know, I just started Lunar Ecom and Pineda Capital this year. They're doing great, but what's going to happen in four years from now mm. with those companies? Um, you know, Home Run Offer, it's continue to do what it's doing. It's great. But now when I look at my life today and people are like, dude, how did like these things grow so fast? It's like, well, I planted these seeds throughout the years 
I learned from each and every one of them about the lessons, the failures, the successes, whatever. And then each subsequent business, I've applied those things that I've learned to that business. And if you have one business that's, dude, even if you did go from 300,000 to a million, super great. But imagine if you did that with three or four different businesses, right. had that exponential leap on all of them. Right. Then it just becomes like absurd. Uh -huh. So I think sometimes it's easier to get into a new industry than to try and scale your current business. And uh -huh. an example of that for me would be the house flipping because that's always been my bread and, bread and butter over the years. And when I look at it, I'm like, man, okay. Um, last year we did almost two and a half million on the house flipping side, gross, um, gross profit. And I'm like, okay, if I wanted to scale this to say 10 million for exit, what do I got to do? You know, walking through the same routine that I just walked through on a smaller level. I'm like, well, I probably got to go to a new market. Um, I'm going to need to hire probably three times the people I need more sales guys. I need three times the contractors probably. Um, you know, we, we might need a bigger office for all these guys. Like, so I start thinking through all these different things and, uh, we're going to need more project managers. We're going to need all that. I'm like, man, to scale this to 10 million is going to be extremely hard. Right. Like I know the path to get there. Sure. But do I want to go do it? And I'm like, probably not. And then I look at, you know, future flipper and lunar. I'm like, okay, what's the path to get those extremely high? And it's significantly easier. And I'm like, okay, if I'm going to just devote time and energy into scaling a business, it's probably easier to try and just get these ones better right. versus that one. Right. So I don't think there's a clear cut answer for everybody listening or for you for that matter. Right. Actually, I do think there's a clear cut answer for you because you asked me on the golf course, you were like, yeah, I'm thinking about starting a tax business. I referred out, you know, a bunch of tax work. I'm thinking about, um, like, what do you think about a brokerage? I'm like, dude, do not do any Don't of those businesses. <laughs> like they're just not going to be worth the time considering what you have with your other businesses. Mm -hmm. You're, you're better off just trying to scale what you currently have. You currently have. Yeah. It, it's interesting because like e-commerce does really well and we can help out a lot of people. Rat race to fi is great because we get to help a lot of people. And it seems like that's kind of like my, like my thing. Like I'm like, what business can, can I do to help other people, uh, but still make myself money. And then I've just referred out so much tax work, which is why I asked you. Cause I, that's one of the questions that I get a lot. Um, and you were like, well, you know, it's not as profitable as you think, maybe put in more time into the business that you do have. Um, and the business that I didn't tell you that we were, that we were working on was our cold callers. Since we have a great strategy for hiring overseas and in South America, uh, we started using them on my business, on my wholesaling business, right. uh, Bluebird. And what we did was we hired one or two and they were doing great. We're closing three or four deals a month. And I'm like, and then other people were asking me for VAs. They're like, Hey, can you get me a cold caller? I'm like, yeah, sure. It's pretty simple. And the same thing. I just kept getting asked for it. So we were like, okay, let's, let's make that into a business and let's help other people find their cold callers. Um, so that's one that we're scaling. But I asked you about, um, the taxes and you were like, yeah, probably not. And, and I think I agree. Cause I'm not passionate about it, but I just get asked all the time for it. Right. So I think that's got a lot to do with it as well. Like, where's your heart at? Where are you passionate? What do you, what do you really want to do? And not jumping into something that, that you're not passionate about. Yeah. Um, and taxes, I'm not passionate about. <laughs> Who is passionate about taxes? You know, as I make more money, I become more passionate about it. So I don't have to pay them, but. Uh, Maybe I'll have to get to that point. Then. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, it just, I. Uh, I tell this to wholesalers and stuff all the time. I'm like, dude, do not open up a brokerage. It's not mm -hmm. worth it. Right. Um, I've got a hundred and something agents. Like I can tell you, I still don't think it's worth it for most people. Right. Um, but yeah, dude, you know, I think what you're doing now is great. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, going to continue to grow and I'll definitely be monitoring you to see if, um, you know, in 2022, you can get that exponential growth and, your current businesses and uh, really take them all to the next level. Um, just like my golf game. No, I think you cut that one out. Like, <laughs> okay. like I said, I think, just uh, like you know, yeah, just say, <laughs> you know, stick to your strengths, right? That's right. <laughs> so, that's uh, yeah, man, I, that, that's what I think uh, I'm excited about to watch these, uh, this next 12, you know, months. And 
Yeah, man. I, I had a lot of fun hanging out with you, dude. I appreciate it. And thank you for your time yesterday. Tell Mindy I'm sorry. I hope she doesn't hate me. I love, <laughs> I love following her on Instagram. Her stuff about you is hilarious. Um, so, no, thank you for your time. It means a lot. I yeah, know man. I know that uh, saying yes to someone else means no to your family. So I appreciate that. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, guys, we'll uh, link to all Felipe's uh, socials down below so you guys can go check him out and connect with him. He will blow up your DMs if you do, so be aware of that. And, uh, you know, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Thanks for watching the Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.